Hi, I'm Patrick Nee, and I'm the uh, CEO and one of the founders of Universal Biomining. And we are focused on applying synthetic biology and bioprocess engineering to the mining industry. We're working on uh, water treatment pro problems, remediation problems, especially with heavy metals, and some steps of the minerals processing uh, processes that the mining industry uses. These are very big problems. We're uh, looking at trying to um, improve very significant challenges that the mining industry has. And some of these approaches that we're using require open release as the mode of uh, launching our products. Some of them are, will be contained or run in industrial bioreactors, but some of them are going to require industrial release to be economic, I mean open release to be economic. For this reason, we've been looking at the regulatory uh, environment, not only in the U.S., but around the world, as the mining industry is a very international industry. The first question we can ask is, you know, are we the first company that's trying to release microorganisms into the wild? And while we all know that crops are uh, widely planted around the world, in the United States, 47 different strains of microorganisms have already been approved for controlled release into the wild. Some of the characteristics they look for in those uh, microorganisms when they do approve them is that it's a non-pathogenic organism, that it is non-human habitating, that it transfers its genetic material relatively slowly, that it's going to be released in a somewhat contained in, or controlled environment. And we believe that our products uh, actually don't hit any of the hot spots that would make the uh, regulators worry about it. So given that this is not, we're not going to be one of the first companies that has gone down the path of releasing a microorganism into the uh, world, the next question is, you know, who is it that we are regulated by to do that here in the United States and in other countries? Most laboratory work is governed by the NIH, but once you leave the laboratory, it really depends upon which what type of application you're trying to bring to market. If it's a drug or a food, you end up going through the FDA and their approval processes. If it's a pesticide, and that includes crops that have toxins engineered into them, you end up going through the EPA. If you're not, not one of those types of applications, you end up getting treated as a new chemical substance, which means the EPA regulates you under the Toxic Substance Control Act. And that requires 90-day pre-notification -noti of your release and your use of the organism commercially. And they even have a faster track R&D exception for field testing, which only requires 60 days of pre-notification. Um, the EPA does evaluate those to see if there's an unreasonable risk of uh, danger to health, human health, or to plants and animals. But in almost all cases where people have applied for, these, uh, for this approval or for these um, approval for release, they have been uh, approved. Around the world, uh, treaties that cover biodiversity really focus on similar issues, uh, plant safety, uh, pesticide safety, and food and um, allergen safety. And on top of that, make sure that everything is well labeled and notifications are uh, supplied to a country into whom you are exporting a biological, uh, genetically modified organism of any sort. So given that in all, throughout most of South America, throughout China, um, in six different countries in Africa, there are already GMO crops being planted, we believe that there is a reasonably well um, understood and well-defined regulatory path in those countries. Uh, the European Union seems to be planting more and more GMO crops, even though there is strong opposition among the populace. But we, that may be changing in time as well. But on top of these regulatory questions, I think one of the critical things that we all need to look at are uh, the ethical considerations and even how we can improve those regulatory barriers uh, or regulatory controls of synthetic biology applications. And there are a couple different uh, groups that are looking at best practices in this area. One of them is SINBERC, which is a collaboration between universities and industry. The other is the Woodrow Wilson Synthetic Biology Project, which uh, also looks at ways that you can demonstrate the safety of synthetic biology applications 
and are working to uh, improve regulation policy. Um, you know, as a small startup in this field, we think, I think that uh, it is very important to have uh, a big industrial partner behind you uh, at this, in almost any field, even if you're going down the FDA route or the more common biopharmaceutical route, Many companies end up tying up with a large pharmaceutical company to get through all the FDA trials. But even as we're working outside in industrial, um, in industrial biotechnology, we find that having a large client that already works in the field that is uh, interested in solving the problems that we're addressing and therefore has the wherewithal financially and the patience to see through what may be uh, an up and down development process is an important consideration relative to going the VC financing route where patients may be shorter and they may not have the exact same alignment uh, with the problem. Their objectives may not be completely aligned with the problem you're trying to solve. Whereas if you have an industrial partner, uh, if you can find the right industrial partner, you should be more aligned.